This morning, uh, we're going to take a break from our series on the seven deadly sins. Uh, we'll take a two-week break. Next week is Easter. Uh, we always have a resurrection sermon on Easter morning. Uh, but this week, what I want us to do to get ready to talk about the resurrection is I want us to spend a week examining the crucifixion. So if you would please turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 22. Uh, we're going to look at the resurrection from a little bit of a different, or from the crucifixion from a little bit of a different angle this morning. But when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said several things. One thing Jesus did is he asked God to forgive those who crucified him. He also looked at the thief next to him and said that he would join Jesus in paradise that very night. While on the cross, Jesus also gave instructions to John to take care of his mother Mary. Interestingly, if you go through all four Gospels, look at all of the crucifixion accounts that we have, combine the sayings of Jesus, we know seven different distinct things that Jesus said while on the cross. Yeah, I don't think that number seven is a coincidence. But the most well-known thing that Jesus said, the most famous thing that Jesus said while he was hanging on the cross during his own execution, the thing that's recorded in not one but two of the gospel accounts of the crucifixion is Jesus saying the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've heard several different interpretations for why Jesus says this phrase. And the most common thing that I've heard is that Jesus and God were somehow separated in that moment on the cross. And so Jesus is actually crying out in pain as he and God are separated from each other and that the pain of the cross was nothing compared to the pain of being separated from God. God is so holy he cannot bear to be in the presence of sin. And so he and Jesus were separated and Jesus cries out, God, why have you forsaken me? Now, I don't particularly care for that interpretation. Okay, for lots of reasons, I don't like that interpretation. Most notably, throughout Scripture, Jesus tells us that he is God. And so I don't think that interpretation is correct, even if it's one you might have heard all your life. Because when you look back at the story of the crucifixion in the Gospels, you notice numerous times the Gospel writers themselves will quote Psalm chapter 22 as a way of understanding the death of Jesus. In fact, that opening line of the Psalm is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, as he hangs on the cross, is quoting Scripture. He is quoting from Psalm chapter 22. Right? And this is a common thing in both Scripture and amongst the rabbis of Jesus' day. Right? A common way to approach Scripture in their day, if you wanted to teach on a passage, is what you would do is you would quote the first line from a longer passage. And if it's a familiar text to everybody, which Psalm 22 is one of the most famous psalms in Judaism, okay, everybody knows the rest of the story. And so you don't have to quote the whole text. You quote the first line and everybody listening would apply the whole text to your situation. For instance, if I said, the Lord is my shepherd, you would know that that entails leading me beside still waters, preparing a banquet table before me in the presence of my enemies. Okay, how do you know that? Well, you know that because you know I'm quoting Psalm 23 and you know the rest of the psalm, right? If you've been raised in church, you heard that all your life. Okay, I know not everyone here was raised in church, but probably if you were, you had to memorize the 23rd Psalm at some point. Okay, the 23rd Psalm being the most famous of the Psalms is a fairly recent phenomenon. In ancient times, one of the most famous Psalms, a Psalm every little Jewish boy and girl would have grown up quoting was Psalm 22. I think Jesus knows exactly what he's doing as he hangs on the cross and quotes the opening of Psalm chapter 22. Jesus isn't just uttering words that were on his heart, as if in a moment of agony, he has to start questioning what's happening to him, as if he's hanging there and suddenly says, well, God, where are you? No, Jesus told his followers time and time again, he was going to the cross. The Son of Man came to die. The entire purpose of his mission was to come and be on this world as the suffering Savior. I think Jesus knew exactly what was happening at the moment of his death. I think he knew exactly where God was at this most critical point in human history. Jesus doesn't have to ask where God is. Jesus knows. 
The Gospels are also very clear that Jesus was in control the entire time of his death. One of the songs we often sing in church is about how he could have called 10,000 angels. The Gospels also agree, the passage Brian just read, it says Jesus gave up his spirit. Okay, it was not taken from him forcibly. He willingly laid it down. No, the cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is not the cry of a helpless man wishing for rescue. I think something else is going on here. And I think the only way for us to really understand it, the only way to wrap our minds around what Jesus is saying as he's enduring the crucifixion is to go back to Psalm chapter 22, look at that psalm again and ask us what's going on in this text that every little Jewish boy and girl grew up reading. Why did they study this text in particular? Why was this such an important psalm? Why does Jesus out of 150 psalms choose this one to quote in that moment? Okay, so notice Psalm 22, starting in verse 1. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were saved. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. All right, notice the imagery going on in these verses. Okay, he says, God, I need you right now because I'm crying out to you for help, and you're not helping me. Right, and you notice things like verse 4, where he says that his ancestors, they got help when they needed it. In other words, this is a guy that has read his Bible. He knows stories like Noah and the ark. He knows how God freed Israel from Egypt. Okay, Egypt was the most powerful nation on earth, and yet when they cried out to God, God sent them Moses, he sent them plagues, he delivered them. He knows how Joshua saw the walls come tumbling down. He knows David and Goliath. We read story after story in Scripture about how God enters in at the moment we need Him the most, saves His people with a mighty hand, with miraculous power. God saves His people. And God, when I cry to you, where are you? Anyone else here ever felt like that? You ever go through difficult times? You pray, you cry out to God, and you say, okay, God, I've read my Bible. I know the stories. I've seen how you acted in the past. Why aren't you acting in that kind of way to help me right now? You know, I think about some of the prayers that I prayed when Luke was in the hospital. I prayed for a miraculous healing so that Luke wouldn't have to go through things that no child should ever have to endure, and I didn't get it. You know, Jesus cures a whole lot of people in the stories with a mere word, right? Jesus, in some of the healing stories, didn't even see the person he was healing. He just told one guy, go home and your daughter will be well by the time you get there. Okay, Jesus, you can do that, but you can't bother to lift a finger for my kid? Really? Doesn't seem fair, does it? Notice the next section of the psalm, starting in verse 12. He says, many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. 
They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouths of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. All right, now this is not literally saying that the psalmist is surrounded by wild animals. I think this is a metaphor for all the various difficulties that face him. Okay, the image here is that while he's being charged at by wild bulls, he also has lions circling him who want to eat him. And if those two things weren't bad enough, while the bulls are charging and the lions are circling, he has a pack of dogs nipping at his heels. Okay? This psalmist doesn't just have one major problem, but part of his problem is that he has so many problems, he can't deal with them all at once. Then he says the very clothes on his back are taken away to be gambled over. He has literally lost the shirt off his back, and he is so weak that all of his bones are visible. Right? The image is supposed to be of a man who is at the end of his rope in every way imaginable. There's nothing else that can go wrong. He has absolutely no hope unless somehow God would come in and answer his cry for help. You know, how many times in your own life have you felt that if you could just deal with one problem at a time, then you'd be okay, right? I can deal with any one thing going wrong in my life, but instead you get 37 different things that all go wrong at the same time. All of them need your attention. So many things are happening, you feel completely helpless. Okay, so what do you do? You say, God, I can't do this. I am at the end of my rope. I'm at the end of my strength. I need you to come into my life. I need you to be my life and my strength. This is a man who has gone through everything. Suddenly, we take a switch. Okay, Verse 21, all the way through verse 21, 21 solid verses. We have agony. We have crying out for God. God, where are you? I can't do this anymore. I'm at the end of my rope. I have nothing that I can do. I need your strength. Suddenly, we take a sharp turn in verse 22. I want you to notice just how quickly this changes from lament, God, I need you. And suddenly, this sounds more like a psalm of praise. Start in verse 22. He says, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of his afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Okay, by the way, that final sentence, he has done it, has an extraordinary amount of linguistic similarity to another final cry. Someone else once said, it is finished. Okay, but you consider this section, and this is such an incredibly stark contrast to the one before. We have 21 verses of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The world is crashing down around me. And then suddenly verse 22 hits you like a, a slap of cold water. Okay, no longer is this a lament. Now this is a psalm of praise. We go from mourning to dancing, and we do it in just a moment's time. Okay, what in the world is going on here? Okay, this is actually a classical theme. You see this in a lot of the lament psalms. And one of the things that's wrong with our hymnody is that we sing lots and lots of the praise psalms, but we don't sing hardly any of the lament psalms. If we did, though, we would see this pattern repeated numerous times in Scripture. Okay, and that is, we go through trials, we cry out to God, but when we do it, we're not just wallowing in our misery. 
Okay, we do it crying out to God with the knowledge, with the assurance, with the hope that God will bring salvation. Okay, I think the reason that the psalmist can end with praise is because he knows that while, yes, he may be going through an impossible time right now, yes, the bulls and the lions and the dogs are all circling him, but he knows that those forces don't get the last word. He knows that God will make it right in the end. Okay, yes, the world looks bleak. Yes, the forces of evil are arrayed against us, but God will triumph. And what the psalmist is doing is he's saying, you know, Lord, I know that I've got it bad right now. I'm calling out for you to help, but I know and I'm looking forward to the day when all of creation will praise the Lord, when all of the world will declare your righteousness and will declare he has done it. Okay, that's Psalm 22. So I want to go back to the cross. Jesus hung on a hill outside the city gates of Jerusalem, a place known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. Arrayed around Jesus was not a huge crowd. It would have been a fairly small gathering. There would have been a contingent of Roman soldiers. There would have been a small group of women. Uh, The apostle John was there. He was probably the youngest of the apostles. He was probably too young to worry about getting arrested. All the other apostles have scattered. They're all scared. Jesus hung between two criminals, one of whom makes fun of Jesus, the other one who recognizes his glory. And as Jesus is on the cross, as he's literally struggling to draw in breath, he quotes the first line of a psalm that everybody knows. He quotes the first line from Psalm 22, a psalm that has three very distinct parts. The psalm begins with a cry longing for God's presence. It moves to a cry for how all the forces of evil are arrayed against us. But then it makes some of the boldest declarations in Scripture about how evil will not have the last word, how all of creation will one day praise the Lord, how every family on earth will recognize the glory, the rule, and the righteousness of God, and that all of earth will feast and worship in the presence of God Almighty. Why? Because finally, after all the years of waiting, he has done it. Now, why do you think Jesus would quote this particular psalm? Because this psalm was his story. Because God is declaring as he hangs on the cross that he has finally done it. That now that time of lament is over. We are in the period of praise. Now it is time when we can say that he has done it. That all of the world should recognize the glory of God Almighty. This psalm is Jesus' story. And ultimately, this psalm is our story too. We don't see all of creation working the way God intended it. We go through periods of life where evil seems to get the upper hand. We don't see the way out of our own struggles. Yet the reason that we gather and worship God each week is because we believe that one day this whole world is going somewhere. We believe that God will get the last word. We believe that all of creation will bend a knee in the throne room of God Almighty and proclaim Jesus as King. One day everything will be restored. And the reason that you and I have confidence that all of creation is moving towards restoration is because 2,000 years ago, Jesus died on a cross, quoted Psalm 22, proclaimed to the world, He has done it. All right, so what do we do with this? How does this change anything about how you and I live tomorrow? All right, I've got four quick points, and I've left you some space on the bulletin to write these down if you take notes. Okay, but the first thing is this, and that is that when you're in the midst of trials, know that they will not get the last word. All right, and I know that this is easier for me to preach than it is for us to live, but that doesn't make it any less true. When we're in the midst of trials, we need to remember those trials do not get the last word. You know, right now my kids are at a stage in life where they like to argue. Uh, I know none of your kids ever did that, but my kids like to argue back at us sometimes. Uh, For instance, I'll tell them it's time to go to bed. And they'll look at me and say, I don't want to. All right. Now, do you think that when they look at me and say, well, I don't want to, that I ever say, oh, well, if you don't want to, then just stay up. Or... Do I tell them, no, it's time for bed, go to bed, right? I get the last word because I'm the daddy, right? And so when I tell my kids, here's the way it's going to be, 
then at least most of the time, right, that's the way it's going to be. You know, in something of a similar way, there are lots of other voices in the world right now. There's a lot of evil things going on. There's a lot of words in the world making lots of noise. But our Father gets the last word. When you're in the midst of trials, no, they don't get the last word, but God does. All right, number two is that when we're in the midst of trials, we should cry out to God. Our first response in any situation needs to be to go to God. When you get bad news, you should pray. When you face a challenging situation at work or in your marriage or anywhere else in your life, your best response is always to pray. You know, again, with my kids, their first response to any kind of adversity is their best response. Okay? They yell for mom, right? What happens um, and when they don't yell to mom, when they get into trouble and try to get out of it on their own, uh, they end up making bigger messes than if they'd just gone to mom in the first place, Right? You know, I think in the same way, uh, we try to fix our problems by ourselves, and we end up making bigger messes. I think if our first response was always to cry out to God, uh, we'd have a lot fewer messes. All right, number three. When we're in the midst of trials, that's also when we should be praising God. All right, now, I know that point number two is easier than point number three, but this is important. All right, it's easy for me when I really get into a mess to cry out to God, but it's a lot harder for me when I'm in a stressful situation to remember that I should also be praising God. Now, I guarantee you that some of the times in my life when I prayed the most was when Luke was going through some pretty scary hospital things and I knew I needed God. If I'm being honest, though, I'll tell you that I've spent more time asking God to do things for me than I have praising God for things that he's already done. And that's really not the best way to grow a healthy relationship with God. I want to learn how to be more like the psalmist who knew how to cry out to God and say, God, here's the way I want you to act, but also knew how to praise God and say, Lord, here's all the things that you have done in my life, and man, I am praising you today. All right, number four is where we're, when we are in the midst of trials, we need to remember all the past trials through which God has brought you. I want you to notice how even in the section where he's complaining about all the things that are going on around him and saying, God, I need your help. I got all this stuff going on. He remembered all the ways that God has acted in the past. You know, again, just bringing my same story of Luke going through hospital stuff back to it. I look back over all the things that God brought us through and I am in awe. You know, I think of the way that God moved us to Texas right at the time we needed to be there, and then he moved us here to Georgia right when we needed to be here. I can look back and see how God, time and time again, has always taken care of my family exactly when I needed it. And I know there's been lots of times where I'll say to Rachel, man, I don't know how we're going to do whatever's coming next down the pike. And she says, David, relax. Has God always taken care of us? Yes. You think he's going to take care of us next time? Yeah. Then quit worrying. When we're in the midst of trials, we need to remember all the past trials God has already brought us through. You know, this morning at this time in our service, we're going to sing a few verses of an invitation song. And what I want us to think about as we end our time together today is I want us to think about what it looks like to remember that Jesus has already solved our real problem. Okay, the ultimate problem that we had was a separation from God. Jesus has bridged that gap for us. Jesus has solved the problem that all of us faced. And when we really think about that problem, then none of the other trials I'm facing are really that big of a deal. Right? So at this time in our service, we're going to sing a few verses of a song. During this song, I will be down front. One of our shepherds will be down front. We would love to talk with you or pray with you about anything that's going on in your life. And note that we don't have the answers, but we serve a God who does. So if we can help you in any way this morning, please come talk to us now while we stand and while we sing.